A couple people were excited when they heard it was me. How are you guys? Some people are excited. That's great. Cool. I am a stand-up comedian, and I was asked to give a talk. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, I can do that. And then I sat down to write it, and I was like, you're a stand-up comedian. You talk all the time. And I was like, now is not the time to write this. It'll come to you. And so what I would like to do at the beginning of my talk is give a shout out to procrastination. <laughs> because through the process of this festival, I have learned the difference between procrastination and believing in oneself. <laughs> and you can't do one without the other, I'll tell you that. I believe I was booked on this in March. And I had all that time. And it's not the first time in my life that I've had all that time. And I'm sure that people in this audience can relate to having a bunch of time for something. And it is probably the worst thing that can ever happen to a human being. I mean, if you want to get into some spirituality, God only took six days. But give me six days and I'll be like, shit! Saturday night, I'll write it. And then I'll probably just talk from the heart anyway. It is Sunday, how perfect. <laughs> Who am I to say I'm not God? You know what I mean? <laughs> it's not up to me. Part of my procrastination process, and perhaps you can relate to this, was going to buy some gummy bears. Anybody else getting off gummy bears? <laughs> I'm in the process of getting off gummy bears. I got on gummy bears to get off gummy vitamins. Because <laughs> we're a gummy-based economy now. <laughs> Pick up your gummy badge on the way out. Your gummy tote. I had to get off of gummy vitamins. This is now, this is just stand-up. I'll get back to the talking part of it. I mean, that's, that's the thing about creating anything anymore at all on the internet or not. Like, you never know when you are and are not making anything. You know, the moment between making and not making is barely decipherable at this point. I've noticed. Decipherable? I just made that up. Thank you. <laughs> this festival is the one place where you can just say whatever you think, and they're like, that's correct. <laughs> It's 300 points on a triple word score. Okay, there's a few people into Scrabble in here. <laughs> yeah. But I did, part of my process of writing this was going to buy some gummy bears. I went to Target to get my Black Forest organic gummy bears for my writing process. Also, how are gummy bears organic, by the way? Are they cage-free? Do they not? free-range gummy bears. But I got myself a bag of gummy bears, and then I got myself a second bag of gummy bears as a reward <laughs> for my first bag of gummy bears. And then I got into the car and I ate the second bag, which was the reward for the first bag. The second bag is the car bag. The first bag is the home bag. <laughs> so I ate that bag before I left. And then I got home all prepared to sit down and write. And I opened my home bag. And in that home bag of Black Forest organic gummy bears, which was supposed to contain five separate distinguished flavors, there were only two flavors. Exactly. If you can't hear in the back, the people in the front are aghast right now. There will be a trauma workshop after this. <laughs> there were only two flavors. And not only were there only two flavors in that bag, they were my two least favorite flavors of gummy. Yes. Yes, XOXO. It was cherry and lemon. Nightmare fuel. I was furious. So I furiously ate half the bag in an act of resistance. 
And then I got my laptop, I opened it up. It was, of course, only charged to 6%. <laughs> I went and found my AC adapter, unwound it, plugged it in, plugged in the magnet thing. It came back out, put it back in again, started charging it, put in my unique and very long Apple ID password. <laughs> Fired up Safari, navigated to the company's website, blackforestorganics.org. <laughs> found their contact us page, opened an email, began writing the email that simply had the subject line, how, question mark. <laughs> and then the body of the email said, could a manufacturing defect like this even happen in the year 2019? <laughs> and I closed my laptop and was like, you've got a problem. You gotta talk to somebody. You also gotta write this thing. That's just a little look inside my process. <laughs> you don't have to give me, you don't have to do that. I do wanna just say how great it is that there's closed captioning. I've never been closed captioned before. Someone is actively doing that, that's cool. I did have uh, two ASL interpreters at a show once, um, and I got to speak with them afterwards. I was like, oh, thanks for coming. Really great um, of you to be here. And the one lady was like, oh, my God, you are such a treat to interpret. <laughs> and I was like, I can't wait to hear what's next. She was like, it was like you had this big roadmap, and you were all over the place. <laughs> she got a lot of cardio during one of my shows. But last night I was doing a show, and it, like this, this is what this is. This is why. This is why I went and got the gummy bears. This is why I procrastinate because I have to stay open to what is happening in my life, to be constantly going, "What's happening? What's happening? And what can I talk about?" And if I wouldn't have done that, I wouldn't have heard this thing last night that I'm now telling you today. I was I did like a guest spot on a friend's stand-up show, and I was going after the next gentleman was performing and he looked out into the crowd and then he came back and said to me he goes do you ever pick out in the crowd like who's gonna hate your set <laughs> do you ever just like know who's gonna hate you and i was like wow and in that brief moment i realized how often i used to do that not only at my own shows but in life just like walk around going, that person hates me. Oh, they definitely do not like my shit. That person thinks I'm so stupid and it's probably been 20 years. Just like walking around thinking that. And I realized how much I did it. And I also realized how much I no longer do it. And in that fraction of a second, he asked me that. And I said, no, man. Everybody out here is here to have a good time. Nobody that came to this thing came here and spent $20 to have chicken tenders <laughs> and choose between the carrots and the celery at the end of it because they're like, that guy's gonna suck. <laughs> Nobody, not a single person. Nobody. They all want you to do well. They came here to have fun. And that guy goes, wow, so positive. <laughs> And I was like, yeah. And then he went out and had a fantastic set. And so I share that with you guys today because, well, I'm gonna talk about more things, but I just had that experience last night and it feels so relevant to everything that I've experienced like on the internet in making things. Is that like, no, you cannot, you can't, nothing you can ever make will make everyone happy. You just can't. And that's not a bad thing. But if you only focus on that one couple of people who are 100 years old at a comedy show, <laughs> thinking they are gonna suck, and so I'm gonna think about that, you're negating all the people that love your shit. <laughs> and there's a bunch of people that love your shit, man. Sorry, there's, I forgot to have a content warning for saying the word shit, I apologize. <laughs> they asked me up top, they're like, is there a content warning? I was like, no, and I just said poop, so I apologize. <laughs> so that's what I've been learning to do in 
comedy. Because the thing is, like, I'm trying to make jokes. I'm trying to make people happy. I'm also trying to say things that make sense. But I know that I can't make everybody happy, and I can't make every single person laugh. And, like, the thing about comedy is, it's fully subjective. And the conversation on the internet is that it's objective. And so I just don't get into that conversation anymore. Because some people like these jokes, and some people like these jokes. And, okay, there's a bunch of different people that like different kinds of jokes. So it's just never gonna work out. Some people like cherry and lemon gummy bears. Those people to me are out of their minds. <laughs> and it's all about expectations too. I've realized recently in what I'm doing is that I set my expectations on people way too high. I've set my expectations on human beings way too high and I've recently learned to set them way lower. And I can give you an example of an experience in my actual life that helped me to do that. I was traveling for work, going through the airport, and I had to go through that big machine that I'm pretty sure only takes naked photos of all of us. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that's the only purpose of the whole thing. <laughs> so I had to get into that thing. I put my little feet on the feet. I like to follow directions. And I was about to do the YMCA. <laughs> also, by the way, that machine, every time that I get into it, I think for just a moment, maybe money's gonna pop out of the bottom. <laughs> and I'm gonna like save a middle school on the way. So I put my feet on the feet and I was about to do the YMCA and another human being got into the machine with me. <laughs> now, how did that person stand outside of that thing and go, yeah, that's a twofer, for sure. <laughs> that's like a luge situation, for sure. Absolutely. I'll just go butt to front, it's fine. What is this, security? We'll just go two people. Do I know you? No? Perfect. Yes, this is how this works. <laughs> and if you need more evidence on how you have to set your expectations on other human beings, much lower. <laughs> just stand outside of a building with a revolving door on it. <laughs> how long have we had revolving door technology? Thousands of years at this point? Just five minutes, five minutes, stand outside of a revolving door, watch a family of four all enter into the same trivial pursuit wedge and go, yeah, this is how this works. This is, this is. <laughs> but like resetting those expectations has helped me in my work. There's two jokes that have sort of, I don't know, evolve is like a, a bit of a strong word to use for them, but like the, the, the basic like idea of the jokes is still pretty similar, but they've grown along a bunch of different lines because I as a person have sort of shifted, grown, whatever, you know? Um, specifically because I recently like within a, I don't, my concept of time is very <laughs> liberal at this point, but uh, I started using they, them pronouns. Yeah, I figured that that was gonna get an ovation at this festival. <laughs> I did, I like that they have the pins, but I like, I just literally forgot to grab one. And I was like, oh, this pin would change my life. But <laughs> I mostly just use they, them pronouns because I want people to really question whether they want to talk to me or not. <laughs> just really spend a lot of time. But I used to have this joke that was about being on uh, an airplane and uh, sitting down and having the flight attendant come over and be like, hello, young man, can I get anything for you? And I used to, the joke was, I used to yell in that human being's face, I'm a woman, just directly into their human face. <laughs> because I used to also just enter rooms that way, just kicking down doors. I'm a woman, happy bat mitzvah. Yes, bye. <laughs> Just letting you know. But I said that to this flight attendant, and then also in the joke, 
And I said, I'm a woman. And then she just like melted into apology immediately. She was like, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. It's just, it's just your hair and your clothes and your general face and the way you carry yourself and your voice. And I was like, shh, 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 shh. <laughs> you had me at I'm sorry. <laughs> so that's the original joke. And you fast forward a couple years later and I have a whole new bit, which I'm going to tell you now. I called a lift. Now, I love taking lifts. I like talking to people. Lift is a nice $10 way that I can get into a conversation and get right back out again. <laughs> it's convenient. I also, I don't understand. Look, if you have social anxiety, that I do get. I'm not, if you have serious social anxiety, I do take that very seriously. But if you don't, and you get into a lift, and you can't even talk to that person that's driving you around in their own vehicle, what's wrong with you? <laughs> what do you get in the back and you just go, mush peasant, take me away. <laughs> How's my day going? What is this, Trader Joe's? I gotta go. <laughs> Have some context. Like eight years ago, people were like, Craigslist is gonna murder you. And now people are like, who are you, Kevin? Yeah, I'll get in your car. I don't care. <laughs> I, mean, I don't. Yeah, I'm just leaving my mom's house. I'm going to my own house. Yes, that's where I'm going. <laughs> I also like to sit in the front of lifts. <laughs> I just, I just want to, you know, be like, I just want to be up front about all of it, literally, <laughs> figuratively. But I do, I ask permission, I ask consent to sit in the front seat, and I like to ask Vincent D'Onofrio style. <laughs> Can I sit in the front? No criminal intent here. <laughs> Thank you. So I call this lift, I get into the lift, I sit down, and I'm in a lift, I'm in the front of a car, so you understand the proximity that we're talking about here. And I sit down, I'm like, hello, and the driver goes, hello, sir, how's your night going? And I don't know if I just felt particularly safe in that particular moment, or what. Also, I kind of felt, it was a short ride, I felt like I could ladybird out of there if I needed to, you know? <laughs> I was also kind of realizing, like, I am the safe space, you know? Like, inside of me, this feels right. Like, he's, he's just being, like, he was being respectful. He was, like, he was getting an answer right to a question that's never been accurate to begin with, you know? Like, he's not trying to say something to me. He has no idea. That's why he's saying it. He's just, like, guessing, you know? And the thing is, there's, like, not enough answers for all the people on the planet. We've only got two boxes. And some people fit into this box. They're like, yeah. I feel like I'm pretty accurate in the box that you put me in. And then some people are like, you know, you put me in this box and now I feel like I'm part of this box. And some people are like, you know what? I want to run around the box. And some people are like, I want to stack the boxes up really high. And some people are like, I want to catch the boxes on fire. My point is, <laughs> there's not enough boxes for everybody. And he was just trying to be nice. And like I said, I felt particularly safe in this short lift ride to just roll with it. And I was like, I don't know, man, I'm doing pretty good. How about you? And he goes, sir, I'm having a great night. What? It doesn't usually go this far. Can we pull over? Can I apply for a job real quick? That is a joke about the gender pay cap. Which I also love when like hyper right wing or like MRAs go like, the gender pay gap is made up. Exactly. Exactly. You're right. That's what I'm saying. Sometimes we agree. So we keep riding in this lift together. And he goes, sir, can I ask you a question? And I'm like, please. And he goes, sir, do you like jazz? And I go, 
you know? Actually, I do. I've been listening to a lot of jazz in my car radio. I just have a radio in my car, and I keep it locked at the jazz station because it uh, keeps my blood pressure down a little bit. You know, I don't road rage as much. And also, I didn't really listen to jazz before, so now when I listen to it, it's all new to me. So yeah, the answer is yes, I do like jazz. And he goes, sir, that's great. That's great, sir. I love that, sir. And keep driving. And then he goes, sir, can I ask you another question? I was like, let's keep this love train rolling. Yes, shoot. He goes, sir, do you like Frank Sinatra? And I was like, do I like Frank? It's Frank Sinatra. Of course I like Frank Sinatra. And he goes, sir, you were a great man. And I was like, hell yeah, yeah. And that is a much better version of La La Land than you'll ever see. <laughs> now, both of those jokes are about the same thing. And the difference is, one of them has a ton of anger in it. And the other one has a lot of acceptance in it. And that's what I've realized, is that in that moment, in that lift ride even, within that joke, I'm just accepting what's going on. And that doesn't mean that there isn't like a threat of danger there. I'm not trying to say that like, oh, everything's fine and blah, blah, blah. But I realized how much of my participating in my own anger and bringing my own anger into every situation was then feeding anger into those situations. Because then recently I went into a gas station to buy some bottled water, which I am still very ashamed about. <laughs> but I'm just being rigorously honest, that's what I was buying. I forgot my clean canteen with me. I have a note on my door to remind me to bring it, and I forgot, and I was dehydrated, and I was like, well, you're gonna kill a turtle. <laughs> so I made peace with the turtle, I apologized to said turtle, and I went to the gas station. Also. Way too many water brands. There's like life water, death water, gratitude water, <laughs> spirit water, way too much. I just need water. So I picked out a water and I put it on the counter. And this is, this, this one, this is like right in between the two of these, which is I set it down. The guy working behind the counter goes, that'll be 209, ma'am. I was like, all right. That's what he's reading in this situation. I don't know how, but... <laughs> That's what he's getting out of it. Most people think my identity is, you work here, right? <laughs> to which I often answer, no. And then they say, are you sure? <laughs> you know, come to think of it, I am at this Target a lot. Also, if I worked at Target and didn't know it, do you want to be asking me where to find shit? <laughs> so he goes, that'll be 209, ma'am. I give him a $5 bill. And then he goes, here's your change, sir. Oh, you got me! I underestimated you, sir. <laughs> you did know what was up. I see, I see. I prefer the mid-season change, personally, <laughs> to the like faux woke person who like accosts me to get my pronouns before they've even found out what my first name is. <laughs> that person that's like, what are your pronouns? What are they? What are they? What do you use? What do you use? What do you use? And I'm like, they, them. And they're like, she uses they, them. She, she uses, she uses they, them. And I found it out. She does. She, she uses it. She is, she's brave. <laughs> Did that hit too hard, XOXO? <laughs> but it helped me to let go of my, like th those, that evolution of those jokes is just like, it's just passing around me and it's, my life is funnier for it. Like experiencing that guy calling me ma'am and then calling me sir is such like, holy shit, I can't believe I get to do that. You know what I mean? 
That's just what my life is. Like, I'm, I get to walk around. Like, as a person who, like, people in my life who ask me what my pronouns are or who figure it out or who just guess and they get it accurate with they, them, love those people. I have so much appreciation and love for those people in my life. But I'm, I also get to ride this wave of just being whatever the heck somebody else thinks I am in every moment. Because sometimes people think I'm straight. <laughs> And that's been liberating for me because I realized how much I was walking around in the world thinking everybody was straight because that's what generation I am. I'm a cuss millennial. I remember landlines, when the internet started, and I voted for Gore. Nobody cares what I think. <laughs> but I walked into every situation thinking that everybody was straight and I've met like younger people who are like, oh, that's funny. I walk into every situation thinking everybody's queer until they tell me otherwise. And I'm like, what? I mean, yes, I wanted progress, but not for you, for me! <laughs> Do you know what I've been through? <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. There's a little hair on this microphone. <laughs> oh, sorry. Some people in the front were very upset about the hair. <laughs> Let's see. Okay. So I did want to talk about, there was like one, because people have talked about uh, going viral and stuff. And I don't know that I, that's a thing that I've, that's ever happened to me. But there was an experience that also, that really helped me a lot on the internet. Uh, and this is like the first time I've ever talked about this, so bear with me. But um, I've, I've also like my practice of, because I don't know that I'm like an internet person other than I use it and it's like a tool, and uh, I've worked on the amount that I'm on the internet, and I'll get to that later, because I want to make you laugh last, but I want to talk about a real thing, um, <clears throat> which is that I used to, I was like working on my relationship to the internet by like not being on it very often, but I wasn't very mindful about it, which is I would pick up my phone, I would check things, I would see like a spiky newsy thing that I would be like, I should comment on that, and then I would comment on it, very like with very strong wording and then I would go I should get off my phone and then I would just put my phone away and it would just explode in the other room without me knowing about it and then I would get back on the phone and be like what did I do <laughs> so this experience taught me to stop doing that and to just go you don't have to comment on anything I don't know if you guys know this but you don't have to say shit sometimes <laughs> we can actually just be quiet and go wow There it went. <laughs> but one time on the internet, we were, as a culture on the internet, discussing what intersectional meant. Like, it just happened on, like, a Friday, I think. I don't even remember when this was. But, like, a, a white woman who I think was a white femme, I don't know if she, whatever. Anyway, white woman was trying to say what intersectional was, and we were having the cultural conversation about whether intersectional was just being a bunch of things or what intersectional actually meant. And on that <laughs> Saturday night... <laughs> that Saturday night, Don Cheadle wore a t-shirt like to introduce the band that said protect trans kids, which is very cool. Uh, for just that that even happened, you know, like that's cool that this is even, these things are, these conversations are even happening. And so then the next day I posted a photo of that that said, if you want to know what intersectional is, it's this. Guess what? It's not. <laughs> and I got off of my phone and I went and like walked my dog and I just like had a day. And then I got back on my phone and was like, oh God because people were t giving me what for about it, rightfully so, because guess what, I was wrong. <laughs> and I realized like, oh, I'm wrong. And I, in, in a, I don't know if you can relate to this, but in a moment, I was, like, I was like a little trapped animal and I wanted to yell at everybody and tell them how good I am and stuff like, and just be like, I'm a good one. And like, guess what, if you gotta yell I'm a good one, not a good one. <laughs> Maybe it might just be in this moment. It might just be this moment. You do good things in your life, but right now, not a good one. So in that moment, I realized like, oh, I just am gonna sit here and I'm just gonna converse with people and I'm gonna listen to what they're saying and I'm just gonna hear what they're saying and then I'm not gonna fight anything. <laughs> and I, 
did that for, I, I literally cleared my calendar for a day. I was like, I can't do these things because I'm just going to do this because I'm not, I'm, I'm not a person who's going to fight all this. I'm wrong. I'm literally wrong. And it's an opportunity to do the thing that I'm always pointing my finger at other people to do, which is like, hey, you messed up. So like, try to do it right. And I don't know if I did it right. I mean, I'm at this festival, so I didn't do it super wrong, I guess. <laughs> but like, I learned what intersectional meant. I don't use it like flippantly, you know, because I've had conversations with people about it. And they're like, I mean, that's a crazy thing to get in trouble for. I was like, is it? I was wrong. Like the last thing, I, that's also what I learned is like, I don't want to be right. Not that I don't want to do right things. Like I want to remain open to what's happening in the world. If I think I'm right all the time, just like when I was angry all the time, if I think I'm right going into every situation, that's not to say that I don't work on knowing what is right and understanding. It's very different. If I go into every situation thinking that I'm already right, what am I ever going to learn? How am I ever going to understand what needs to be different in the world or in me? Because I can't control the world. I can only be me inside the world. So if I went into that situation on the internet, which is so tiny, but also for me that day, huge. It was huge. And I could have spent that day like yelling and saying all these things that I do right in my life that are good and positive things. Like literally that day, I had, uh, I, I put out these t-shirts with a company and all the profits went to two nonprofits. One was uh, Trans Lifeline and the other was Project Q. And Project Q is a local uh, nonprofit in Los Angeles that uh, they give haircuts to like homeless queer youth so that they can, you know, get jobs and like apply for things and, and also just feel good. You know, like it's simply that. It's not even for a purpose any bigger than that. And they're, I think, a really great, you know, company entity, and so I wanted to make them some money. And that day, I found out that the money that we made off of these t-shirts allowed them to pay their rent for so long that they could open up more, like, queer people of color businesses owned in that thing. And I was like, that's very intersectional! But nobody on the internet knows that. And for me to sit on the internet and yell that would just be like, that's so not the thing, you know? And so I just spent that time going, what do I need to learn from this? Which is, that's not the information for right now. The information is, yeah, I was wrong. And I'm happy to be wrong today so that I can learn something new. And that is my new approach to the internet. Is like, I just pretty much make fun of Joe Biden. But other than that, <laughs> I don't really need to make fun of other people because everybody's learning. And that's the thing, like when, with, People approaching me and people that make mistakes with my pronouns, if they're people that I love and care about, I'm very open to it because like it's learning. Like I, there are people in my life who will say she and then they in the same paragraph. And that is really kind to me, you know, because they're like paying attention to what they're saying and grateful for the experience, which has been really wonderful. So anyway, that was a very long winded way of talking about something. I don't know. But I will, I will end with this because it's like been a half hour, I think. I'm timing myself. There's no clock right there. That's okay. Um, <clears throat> so this is like a festival that's about like kind of making things on the internet. And I've, I'm spending so much less time on the internet. But I do think that the, the time that I do spend on the internet is so much better for the amount of time that I don't spend on the internet. If that makes sense to you. Yes. <laughs> Just big nods. Yes. And I'll tell you this story because I feel like you might enjoy it, about the best time I didn't get on my phone. <laughs> so I went to the movies, and I went to the concession stand, and I made my usual order, which is a medium popcorn, no butter, and a medium Sprite, no ice. Because if I'm gonna spend $5 on a Sprite, I better get $5 worth of Sprite. So I make my order, the woman helping me turns away to get my popcorn and stuff, and I don't get on my phone. I wanted to compulsively pull that phone out, I didn't do it. I just stood in the movie theater lobby. Period. <laughs> you guys ever just stand someplace anymore? Sometimes I just stand outside. You stand there for a little while, sometimes, <gasps> butterfly. 
Do you guys know we still have those? <laughs> Keep an eye out. So standing in this movie theater lobby, not on my phone, didn't get on the internet, stayed in regular reality, not augmented reality. And I'm so glad I did. Because moments later, a woman came out of another movie theater and was like, help! And I was like, I am prepared for whatever comes next. <laughs> she was like, my red vines are incredibly stale. I was like, I'm prepared for that, but I did not expect it. <laughs> also, that is a movie theater-based emergency for sure. Because that's the other thing, XOXO, context is always key. <laughs> so she's like, my red vines are stale, please, to the manager. Please, I just, could I just get a different candy? Could I just, I just, the movie's about to start. I just, I'll pay the difference. I'm happy to pay the difference. And he goes, well, you can get something else. You just have to pay the difference. And she's like, I just said that. <laughs> she's losing her shit. So she picks out a new candy. And he goes, that'll be 75 cents. And she goes, oh, shit, I left my money with my husband in the theater. Can I just pay you on the way out? And the manager goes, no. <laughs> Heartless. But at that exact moment, the woman helping me gave me my popcorn and my drink and I was like, that'll be $9, please. And I looked into my wallet. I had two fives. Guess who's gonna be a hero? <laughs> this guy. And I go, I will pay your candy difference, madam. And she goes, you will? And I say, you bet your sweet patoot I will. <laughs> Content warning. <laughs> so I pay her candy difference. I give the dollar. And she goes, that was so nice of you. And I was like, that's oh, okay. It's really no trouble. It's really just a dollar. I'm happy you're happy. And we part ways. And then she turns and goes, hey, do you want some of this candy? <laughs> and I go, no. I couldn't possibly. You've been through hell. But she saw my face. And what she saw on my face was pure joy from childhood. Because the new candy that she had purchased was my first love in the candy world. Also, you guys heard that gummy bear story. She had my first candy crush, if you will. She had replaced her stale red vines with Kit Kat. That's right. Mm. It's a Kit Kat crowd. So you get it. I love the jingle. I love the commercial. I love a chunky. I love a big cat. I will even eat a white chocolate Kit Kat. That's right. That's right. I said it. Portland, I said it. So she saw that register on my face when she was like, could I give you some of this candy? I was like, But I was like, no, I couldn't possibly. And I turned to leave. And she said, please. <laughs> let me break you off a piece of this Kit Kat bar. <laughs> and I never would have gotten to experience a real live Kit Kat commercial. <laughs> If I would have just been tweeting on my phone, you know? And she did. She gave me a loose Kit Kat. <laughs> which I then wrapped in a napkin, like a little sleeping bag, sort of a evac situation from my loose Kit Kat. And as I was leaving, I walked past the concession stands la stand lady, and she was like, wow, that was brave. <laughs> And I was like, you think that's brave? I use they, them pronouns. <laughs> There's no stand. <laughs> I usually like to leave on laughs, but this is a talk, so.
I do, I just want to say this last thing. Like I do I do really think that thinking seeking is is what we need to be doing. You know, seeking and not necessarily even finding, you know, because I think that is truly the way to understanding. But somebody's, I'll leave you guys with just this last thought, and it isn't a joke, because um, my last thought that I usually leave people with as a joke is doesn't it seem like toads are just elderly frogs? But someone said this to me recently, and I've been thinking about it so much because my life, recently in my life and in my making, I've been trying to push cynicism and skepticism out and let this sort of openness and like seeking in. And this statement, when they said it to me, I was like, come on. And then I've been thinking about it nonstop. So I feel like it's something that I want to share with everybody. And I, we were talking about Los Angeles as a place, you know, as a place for creative people to end up. And she was like, we're all here because somewhere along the line, someone shone a light on humanity and we just want to do that back. And I was like, come on. But now I'm here. And I see all these people in this audience and I see everybody walking around with little pins and little badges and making zines and like making shit. And that's the true thing of it, is that somewhere along the line, somebody in your life shined a light on humanity and you're like, oh, there it is. And so that's our job. Everybody in this room has a flashlight and that's what you get to keep doing, is you get to make somebody laugh or you get to make somebody think but that's all you have to do, is just shine a light on humanity, because it's still out there. We're in here right now. It's gonna be great, because it already is. Thanks so much for having me. Is somebody, okay, I think I'm just leaving. <laughs>